What I've tried to do is provide an alternative paradigm for understanding human nature that allows for the kind of compassion you're talking about, both for yourself and, you know, when you're in self and you think, oh, this person who's being mean to me, that's their part, and they must, there must be some kind of pain behind it. It's like you have x-ray vision, you see past their protector and you see their exiles, and then you can have compassion for them even when they're, it doesn't mean you're gonna be soft and let them beat you up, but it means you can stay in self and defend yourself rather than letting your protectors run wild, which is, you know, most of the conflicts in the world are protector wars, basically. Welcome to the 1000 Days Sober Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I'm not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol. I am an amazing father. I'm an amazing husband. I am an amazing leader, lover, master coach. And I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people live a kick-ass lives. okay? And today I'm going to be talking with Dr. Richard Schwartz on some uh, the, the work that this guy does is just absolutely incredible, right? It's incredible work. It's a game changer in the field of addiction, um, even though he's been doing it for so bloody long. Uh, but it's a, it's a game changer in, in my eyes. I, I haven't heard people talk about this too much when it comes to addiction. Um, and in my own private practice, um, in my coaching practice, this has really helped people a great deal, okay? And it's effectively, you can boil it down to like, you really don't want to drink. And then there's a part of you that does, and there's a part of you don't, and you end up having this fight inside your head, right? Um, and that's just a snapshot of what Schwartz says. It's like just common with all human beings. We are all made up of a collection of different parts, of different types of personalities, and we really need to raise awareness and get get to know them and get to know why they exist and uh, what purpose they serve and what burdens they carry, and uh, you know, ultimately to find out that they all are there to keep us safe. Right. And uh, Richard's work is amazing in a coaching perspective. But uh, what is more amazing is it has the capacity, if we all think this way, to actually change the vibration of the world, which is really important. So Richard Schwartz began his career as a family therapist and an academic at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, There he discovered that family therapy alone didn't achieve full symptom relief. And in asking patients why, he learned that they were plagued by what they called parts. These patients became his teachers as they described how their parts formed networks of inner relationship that resembled the families he had been working with. He also found that as they focused on and thereby separated from their parts, they would shift into a state of characterized by qualities like curiosity, calm, confidence, and compassion. He called that inner essence the self and was amazed to find that even in severely diagnosed and traumatized patients um, and from these explorations, the internal family systems, the IFS model, was born in the early 80s. IFS is now evidence-based and has become a widely used form of psychotherapy, particularly with trauma. It provides a non-pathologizing, optimistic, and empowering perspective and a practical and effective set of techniques for working with individuals, couples, families, and more recently, corporations and classrooms. In 2013, Schwartz left the Chicago area and now lives in Brookline, MA, where he is on the faculty of the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. All right. So without further ado, I will shut the hell up and leave you in the capable hands of Dr. Richard Schwartz. So, Dick Schwartz, just as I was saying, it's a, a great honor. Um, I first heard about your work working with Christine Hasler at the Elementum Coaching Institute. And Christine brought your work into Elementum. I was in the first raft of coaches. So there was about 100 of us. So she's taught us all about everything that she's known from your work. And I listened to your podcast with her, and it was amazing. And um, so... The ripple effect that you're having with your work is quite incredible. And I just want to start out by just saying thank you for changing my life and changing the lives of those people that that I touch and that they touch and so forth. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, it's um, a strange time for me. You know, I've been at this for, it'll be 40 years. And I'm- I know. <laughs> and and people, mostly- are just, people are just getting to it. Mostly just laboring in obscurity, you know, just trying to, <laughs> anybody who would listen, <laughs> I'd, I'd be badgering them. 
And then I guess it's probably the last decade or so it's uh, sort of caught on. And so now I'm now I've got the opposite problem. I'm just barraged and everybody uh, after you. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, let, let's start out for people. I mean, I, I bang on about your work quite a lot on, on the podcast. So I'm sure the large core group of our listeners knows what, what, what I'm, what we're talking about when we talk about internal family systems and parts work. But for those that, that are new or are just jumping on here the first time, um, could you just give a little bit of a brief outline about what internal family systems is and also just touching upon in that the mono mind philosophy and I think you put it in your book multiplicity um, and how it's been pathologized. So yeah. I, I kind of like that. If you could start with that, would be great. Okay. Yeah. So the traditional way of understanding the mind is that it's unitary, that we have one mind, one brain, uh, and that various thoughts and emotions emanate from that mind and brain, but they're kind of ephemeral. And uh, I held that view until about 1982, I think it was. And my clients started to talk about these parts of them. And they talked about these parts as if they had a lot of autonomy and, and could make them do things they didn't want to do and talk to each other inside their heads. And uh, at first, I was a bit freaked out because I thought maybe these people are sicker than I thought. And then I listened inside myself and, oh, my God, I've got them, too. And, and I'd never really paid any attention to them. I just thought that was thinking. And so I uh, began very curious. I was lucky to have a couple of clients initially who were really articulate about the phenomena and could track, you know, four or five parts and tell me how they all interacted. And as I was listening it sounded like uh, a family of, of little interacting people inside of them. And so in terms of the pathologizing, you know, uh, voices in your head or uh, having many personalities is, is both in the culture, but also in psychotherapy been seen as a sign of severe pathology and mm. Uh, some of that is, is propagated by the multiple personality movement, which is now called DID. And uh, and some just, you know, because when people, quote unquote, go crazy, they do hear voices mm. and uh, they're talking to people who aren't there. And so I can understand some of it, but uh, my take is that it's the nature of the mind to have these parts that it's not a sign of pathology. It's not the product of trauma, but it's actually very healthy to have a bunch of inner beings or entities who have various qualities and perspectives and emotions and, uh, and are here to help us in our life. And it can be extremely helpful, but trauma or attachment injuries like bad parenting force them out of their naturally valuable states into extreme roles and freeze them in time during the traumas so that, you know, if I were to ask one of your parts, Lee, how old it thought you were, most of the time you get a single digit back, it thinks you're mm. still a little kid. Mm. It thinks it has to do what it had to do back when you were getting hurt as a kid. It thinks it still has to do that for you. And it thinks the world is as dangerous now as it was back then. Mm. So, yeah, so they get frozen in time and they get for, stuck in the role they were stuck in that they needed to do to protect you back then. They get kind of stuck in that, that role with that energy, what I call the burdens that came into your system from the trauma, which the definition, which are the extreme beliefs and emotions that you were feeling at the time of the trauma get lodged inside these parts, almost like a virus mm. and then drive the way they operate thereafter. So as I was getting all of this from my clients, it, it, it uh, 
seemed like this was something very different, very different way to understand all kinds of psychiatric syndromes. And I began to, to try it out. And lo and behold, it is. And it does uh, work very well with things that uh, traditionally had been kind of written off mm-hmm. because rather than fighting with the parts, we listen to them, we honor them for their service, like you might the military, and we help them out of these extreme roles. And to do that, we often have to see where they're stuck in the past. And, and there's a process by, by which we can literally bring them into the present and help them unload these extreme beliefs and emotions. So Again, the basic premise is that it's the nature of the mind to be multiple. It's a good thing to be a multiple personality in that sense. <clears throat> They're all valuable. They're like kids in a, in a literal external family who get forced out of their naturally valuable conditions into roles they don't like by the dysfunction in the family. The same thing happens to these inner children. And some of them as I said, are forced into these protective roles. And then others, usually the younger, what are called inner children, who before they got hurt were vibrant and lively and loving and open. Because they're the most sensitive parts of us, they get hurt the most. or They get stuck with the burdens of, of terror or ashamed, sense of worthlessness or mm. emotional pain. And after they get burdened that way and they're stuck in these terrible scenes of the past, we don't want to be around them. And we try to lock them away in inner basements or abysses and mm. and just move on. You know, this is a United States is a very rugged individualistic, just move on, don't look back kind of culture. Yeah. So we think we're moving on from the memories, sensations, emotions, and beliefs from the trauma, not realizing we're locking away our most precious gifts because we think that's all they are. Mm. And so IFS is a way to actually go to those exiled parts and bring them back and do it in a safe way. And the other big discovery of IFS is that, and I just stumbled into this one by, because I'm a family therapist, I'm trying to help them get to know each other, help my client get to know them. So I'm having these dialogues and inside of pe- people having these dialogues describing to me what's happening. And I would find that they would, they would get stuck. And I thought, just like in an external family, When you're trying to have two people talk to each other and they get stuck, a lot of times there's a third person interfering. So I thought maybe there's a third part interfering, and I would ask them to get that one to step back and relax, Mm -hmm. separate. And as people did that, it was like this other person would pop out who knew how to relate in a healing way to the part with a lot of compassion, a lot of curiosity, a lot of calm, what we call the eight C words of self-leadership. A lot of um, confidence and courage and and uh, creativity and connectedness and clarity. And when I would and I would do the same process of getting other parts to separate and other clients, it was like literally the same person would pop out, the same qualities. And when I would ask clients, "What part of you is that?" They'd say some version of, "That's me. That's not a part. That's mm-hmm. who I am." So I came to call that The Self with a capital S. And now, for almost 40 years later, thousands of clients later, thousands of people using this all over the world, as you mentioned, we can safely say that that self is in everybody, can't be damaged, is just beneath the surface of these parts and knows how to heal. And that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. That's the big discovery of IFAS and, and mm-hmm. how to access that self quickly. So there's your nutshell. Yeah, thank you for that nutshell. I mean, there's actually um, a paragraph in your book that, um, you know, describes it really well, I think. I I made a note here. It's like the, it's the natural state of the mind to have parts. 
So it's the natural state of the mind to have parts. They're not the product of trauma or internalizing external voices or energies. It's just the way we're built. And that's good because all of our parts are valuable qualities and resources to give us. And as I'm reading that, I'm getting chills and I'm getting up, I'm getting a little bit upset because um, you say how we relate to the inner world is how we relate to the outer world. Yeah. And that is so powerful. I, I find my own upbringing being surrounded by, oh, just get on with it, stop shouting, stop crying, stop screaming, stop laughing, mm -hmm. and then becoming that with your own kids, with your own people, and mm -hmm. being very judgmental and blame. Or like if somebody does something, like I need to blame somebody, mm -hmm. um, having enemies. And your work um, – changed everything for me because all of a sudden I can just say, oh, okay, um, I'm, I'm normal. And, and that person over there now who I'm saying is hurting me, they're normal as well. And there's a reason that's happening. And it's because their parts are activated and they're activating my parts. And now if I can get into myself and tap into their self, we can, we can have a conversation about this. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, you you really get it. I love hearing the way you talk about it. I think, I think the way, the reason I get it so much is for me, it almost goes back to forgiveness. You know, mm -hmm. people say, um, I have great difficulty forgiving people. And I'm like, I don't because I've needed so much forgiveness in my life from so many people that whenever I upset somebody, I, I, I like, I need to, I need to forgive them straight away. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, I guess in a bizarre way, your work is allowed me to more safely reveal my true self mm -hmm. and my parts without feeling shame. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a good example and then you can let me know what you think about this. My Instagram feed is very curated. So it's just typically people who I admire in certain fields, such as your own and I'm into codependency, addiction, all this kind of stuff. And there's a, there's, I see a theme that's bothering me and it's around narcissism. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason it's bothering me is because I know that I have behaved in, in ways in which someone would uh, label me a narcissist mm -hmm. and the way that the world labels you a narcissist is not, it's not very healthy and you don't want to be labeled that. Um, now, my view of my own personal narcissism is, A, when I was ticking those narcissistic boxes, I didn't even know that I was doing it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I knew I shouted at my wife. Yeah, I knew that uh, I shouted at my kids, but I, I didn't understand that I was gaslighting. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that I was... Um, trying to protect myself on my own shit. None of that. So, so because of now your parts work, I'm able to identify the parts of me mm -hmm. who people would quote unquote call the narcissist. And now I've got self-awareness mm -hmm. and now I can do something about it. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to get self-awareness if I'm too afraid of wanting to be a narcissist because everybody's saying, Oh no, 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 not Lee. No. There's a narcissist who knows what he's doing and he's doing it deliberately. And then there's you. And then there's people who are not narcissists. <laughs> I don't think like that. Help me out, Dick. No, you're right. And that, again, is the problem with this monomind view that, you know, you're one diagnosis and that diagnosis describes every aspect of you. And, you know, I was just debating with someone about psychopaths don't have a conscience, you know, and. That's not true. They're dominated by a part that fits the, the, the profile. But mm. if you ever get that part to separate, they have a brutal conscience usually. And so, yeah, it's just uh, what I've tried to do is provide an alternative paradigm for understanding human nature that allows for the kind of compassion you're talking about, both for yourself and, you know, when you're in self and you think, oh, this person who's being mean to me, that's their part, and they must. there must be some kind of pain behind it. You have, it's like you have x-ray vision. You see past their protector, and you see their exiles, and then you can have compassion for them even when they're 
It doesn't mean you're going to be soft and let them beat you up, mm. but it means you can stay in self and defend yourself rather than letting your protectors run wild, which is, you know, most of the conflicts in the world are protector wars, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, your book, No Bad Parts, I wasn't expecting it when I read it, but it was such a beautiful advert of how your work is um, so important in terms of raising the vibration of the world and not just raising the vibration of the individual. I mean, you have to write, you have to, you know, they're both uh, compatible, but yeah. I loved it how you was like, no, 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 let's use this to change the world. If everybody was able to accept that there's no bad parts, uh, like I'll give you a good example. Me and my wife, right, since I knew your work, are closer than ever. I would say about a year ago, she, we were talking about divorce. Um, I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't get hold of it. I was like, I don't drink anymore, so what's the problem? And I realized through your work that I was being activated by her parts and her parts were being activated by my parts. And then all of a sudden, I was, be, I was able to look at her and go, wow, like her parts are activated and they're trying to keep her safe. Because my parts are activated. If I can be more self-led, then maybe I won't activate her parts. And that is what's happening in my relationship. And I, and I have a child who witnesses that, mm -hmm. who is now going to grow up and we will be able to talk to her about this. And like last night, it was in bed, Dick. I got to share this. It's like she's having a meltdown like at two o'clock in the morning. And uh, Liza said, look, Zia, you got to be a little bit quiet because like, you know, nanny and granddad are sleeping. And she said, I will not <laughs> keep my feelings inside. Don't keep my feelings inside. I need to scream. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's so beautiful because you realize in that moment that, yeah, when I was younger, I weren't allowed to do that, which then led to exiles being buried and protect the parts, protecting. You know? That's right. And, yeah, and most of us wind up passing these what we call legacy burdens on to our kids and so mm. on. And you're you're breaking that pattern by uh, just by doing the work you're doing. You know, you're not mm. your kids are going to have a different kind of childhood. Mm -hmm. Talk about legacy burdens a little bit, because well, actually, just to accentuate it, just again, just cover burdens and yeah. legacy burdens, so people could get a good understanding of that. Yeah. So. Um, what I was talking about before we call personal burdens. So they're the extreme beliefs and emotions and energies that came into your system from your direct experience of life, from the hardships of life. And again, they attach to these parts and drive the way they operate. We also inherit burdens from our ancestral lineage or from our ethnic group or from just marinating in this culture, in the culture we live in. There are all kinds of these burdens floating around, extreme beliefs and ideas, beliefs and emotions that got into the culture, got into our lineage from things that might have happened decades, centuries earlier and just get passed on down. And, and now we, we carry them. And mm -hmm. so, and, and often because... We, they've been there since we were born. We're hardly even aware of them. You know, we just think it's the fish are the last to know about water. You know, we, it's yeah. just the way we, we are. So they're often hard to find. You need somebody on the outside to kind of let you know that's not, that's, that's the kind of extreme belief you're carrying. Mm -hmm. And, but once you find them, in contrast to personal burdens, which, usually require witnessing what happened to you in the past when you got it and then getting that part of you out of where it's stuck in the past. Legacy burdens, all you need is the part realizing it's not who it is and, and wants to unload it because it happened, like I said, long before you were born. You don't have to witness what happened. Mm. Some, sometimes they do want you to, but most often you don't. Mm. And you can just send it out turn it out of your system so is um I'll give you an example of something and tell me if this is a if this qualifies as a legacy burden or not out of interest because i was thinking about it when i was reading the book 
So I grew up in an old mining town in South Wales in the UK called Ogmore Valley. So it was like 8,000 people. Um, and I help people quit alcohol. And the way that I've done that is, is just through my own experience. Like I, I experienced it. I got out of it and I was like, okay, how did I do that? And how can I teach other people, right? So a big part of it for me was I realized when I thought about it, oh, wow, like society actually breeds me. Like I'm programmed to drink alcohol from birth. And then when you try, when it becomes an issue for you, it's really difficult to extricate yourself from it because everybody around you starts to treat you as a pariah because you are going against the grain and you're doing something that that activates parts in them that then become afraid, almost like in a, in a projective sense. Is that an example of a, a legacy burden? Yeah, the, the, um, the desire to drink a lot would be the legacy burden. Mm. Yeah. Uh, is a family tradition in a sense. Yeah. And, and a, you know, tradition in your town. Mm. And um, yeah, that is part of the issue. When people, when we find these legacy burdens and you ask the part, are you ready to unload it? A lot of times they'll say no, because if I do, it's going to disrupt the family. Or if I do, it's going to change my life in a way that's scary or something like that. We, we have to do a lot of work with the part before it's willing to let go of it. Mm. But yeah, I mean, my my goal with addictions is to help people s- relate to these parts that that uh, make them addicted in a very different way. Mm. So instead of fighting with them or or vilifying them, they start to get to know them and wind up honoring them and helping them retire. Yeah, you. <laughs> You you actually check my I haven't done it yet, but my I have a program called the Strive Method. There's over 120 videos. It takes people about six months to go through at their own pace. I it's have to check I called the Strive Method. Strive Method, yeah. So I I actually have to change a, a, a big part of it. You know, like most methods have like some really good building blocks. <laughs> One of them, like, since I've been doing your work, I'm like, okay, I've got this wrong. Because obviously I've been creating it through my own personal experience without any kind of professional kind of like background. So I tell you what it, what it is, is I, I realized very early was um, I've got no problem giving up celery juice, right? Like if I wanted to quit celery juice tomorrow, I wouldn't have a problem. Um, but I had this big problem uh, quitting alcohol, right? And why is that? Well, I, I get triggered. Like something will happen in my life typically related to an emotion for me. I know it could be people. I know it could be environments, but it always boils down to emotion. I either want to feel happy or I want to avoid feeling sad or avoid feeling uh, anxious or ashamed. Um, and, then I, and then I drink alcohol. So I had these triggers. And I realized that the precursor to the trigger, sometimes the trigger could last several days and I'm fighting it, or it could just be boom in that moment but it's typically a conversation in my head between one or two people right i pegged that down and i called this uh discussion um resistance so i said and taught mealy davy is having this conversation with resistance and resistance is what's causing me to drink and i have to battle resistance and i have to beat resistance and if i get over resistance then i won't need to drink alcohol And then after looking at your work, now I'm like, okay, resistance isn't one entity. Resistance is multiple entities, uh, firefighters uh, who show up, who want to drink to keep me safe. And then this is the key thing. And I don't go to battle with it. I need to love each and every part because they are keeping me safe. And to go into myself and help other people to say, hey, I just, this part that that decided when it was 10, that it was going to drink alcohol and keep you safe. Can you just tell this part right now how much you love it and to thank it and hug it for what it's done for you is an absolute game changer. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very different way to do it. And, you know, you don't want us to stop there because it won't change just because you love it. Because if, if if it's still protecting you, 
it still has to do the job of keeping you away, keep you higher than your exiles, mm. then it's it's not going to be able to relax. And so that's the first step is to love it and honor it for its service. Because, you know, with a, a lot of uh, the, the drinking parts that I run into, I'd say, okay, what are you afraid would happen if you didn't keep them high? So he'll kill himself. The next firefighter on that ladder is suicide. So I'm mm-hmm. keeping them alive. And it's true, basically. So these parts need to be honored. But then to ask them what they protect, and you mentioned a bunch of exiles earlier in terms of what, what happens when you get triggered, mm-hmm. and then go to those parts that carry the shame or carry the fear and un- unburden them. So now they're just happy inner kids. And then bring in that addictive part to see it doesn't have to take care of these kids this way anymore. Or it doesn't have to keep you away from them anymore. Hmm. What might it like to do instead? And we've done this with many addicts. And, you know, they take on new roles that are, that are helpful. But it's a mistake to think that these parts will just drop their their jobs because you like them now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They need to be liberated. They need to be freed up from the from the responsibility of taking care of you that way. I interrupt this broadcast to bring you the deal of the century. If you want to join the 62% of people who have graduated from the Strife Method and are still not drinking one year later, then join the Strife family today. Head over to 1000daysober.com to sign up for our incredible subscription service where for $99 a month you gain access to more than 120 coaching videos in the Strive Method and join our incredible, our beautiful Strive family. And if you think it's a pile of pants, as long as you've done the work, I'll refund your subscription. So you've got absolutely nothing to lose. Right, back to the conversation at hand. Mm, yeah, one, one. Yeah, good. Well said. I mean, one of the things that I've there's a couple of things that I've recognised in when I've done uh, parts work with my clients, um, and one of them is um, that discussion between true self and the firefighter part. The firefighter part, I often find wants to want burden, but and there's always a but. Is it? It doesn't want to disappear. Like it. It doesn't. It. it it doesn't want nothing to do things like, well, I got, if I, if I accept that you're not 12 anymore and you are actually 45 year old Lee Davy, I still haven't trusted you before up to this point. Why would I just suddenly like give up all control and, pa- and power? Cause I'm actually, my role is to keep us safe. And I haven't come across the firefighter suicidal parts yet. If I did, I think I would um, refer them on. The the parts that I've come across are firefighter parts who then say, like I, I'll be I'll say like um, ask true self to ask them like, what are you afraid of if you don't take that drink? And very often it's well if we don't take that drink, then they'll think they'll think we're an idiot or they'll think we're stupid or they'll think we're a freak. And then I'll kind of like ask um, the part to, to go into the waiting room, and then I'll talk to the uh, client and say. When, when was when was the first time you ever thought you was a freak? Mm-hmm. And and then we typically find then that there's a part that that is this beautiful, almost almost like a beautiful younger version of true self that was just at some point like shamed or belittled or ridiculed. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of like, oh right. So this protect this firefighter needs to make sure that true self. Like, it's not unsafe to let the exile kind of have more presence. That's right. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you have to earn that firefighter's trust because, uh, you know, you didn't take care of that boy uh, a long time ago, and, and you still haven't. You locked him up for however many, 40 years. Mm. So you have to show him that you're going to take care of him now. Mm. And, but, you know, the, the good news is, all of these parts, even the ones that are taking over all the time and running your life, they really want somebody to come along and say, I've got this. Just trust me. Mm. And then earn their trust. And self can do that. But it, sometimes it takes some time. 
Well, this is why I think it's so important with triggers. You know, I was reading um, a post the other day on social media and somebody had written, you know, when we're triggered, just know and understand that it will pass. You can surf it. It will be okay. And I was reading it and this, my intellectual part of me is saying, well, yeah, okay, no problem. But in the moment, in the moment oh. that ain't going to work. That it's not going to work. work. That, that there needs to be, over time, a relationship built and an awareness that who or what part of you is triggered in that moment. And then when you build that relationship, you're able to feel triggered and go, oh, and I love naming them. Oh, there you are, Artful Dodger. I got one called Artful Dodger. There you are, Artful Dodger. You need to be seen right now. That's I right. get it completely. Okay. Right right now, we're just going to chill. I got this. And then we'll do something new later on, which would be fun for you. Like, that really helps, I find. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Yeah, that's the first step is being aware of them. Because most of the time, mm. we're not. They just take over and we think, oh, I'm mad now. Or, or now I'm... You know, but if you oh, okay, there's that part. Okay, I remember him. Oh, there you are. Okay, do you want to, you need to take over for a while? All right, it's all right. All right, I'll, but let me talk to you later. Or, no, nah, you don't need to take over right now. Just let me handle the situation. Yeah. And I'll feel a, a big shift because these parts have the power to totally change your perception and change how you see your partner or how you how you relate you know what you think about her uh, they can totally take over and you just think oh what am I doing with this woman you know but I, now I say oh there you are I know you hate it when she says this thing and it's okay you don't have to totally take over you can let me still like her and yeah, yeah. That and step back I remember so. I remember reading about Bowlby's work and learning that I had an anxious attachment style and my wife had an avoidant attachment style. And that, that helped me to go, oh, all right, I can see how I trigger the behavior that actually activates me and makes me feel uncomfortable. So if I actually stop doing that, and a good example is uh, I don't, I don't have to kiss my wife on the lips before I go to bed anymore. I, I just always did that part, you know, and I, I, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it until I, like, I just thought, oh, it's just polite to give, give everyone a kiss before you go to bed. But then when I dug a little deeper, I was like, no, actually I do that because I want to feel like, like she's not going to leave me at the fucking core of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. But then when I did your work, I was able to break down avoidant and attachment styles into individual parts that had right. avoidant and attachment. So do you ever, do you ever get into conversations with these different masters and uh, uh, of different theories and kind of get together and see how they all interact? Uh, well, you know, funny you should ask, because I just today did a uh, interview with uh, Peter Levine, you know, his work. Yeah. 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 On emotions. Yeah. So he's, uh, sorry, trauma. Yeah, uh, trauma in the body, somatic mm. experiencing. And he's, uh, they have an annual conference, and so I'm part of the conference. We did a recorded interview, and it was fascinating to talk about the, the differences and the similarities. And you know, I asked him right off, you know, you don't really talk about parts, but do you believe in them? Do you work with mm. them at all? And he said something like, well, I... I don't call them parts. I call them aspects. And right. I, you know, um, but yeah, we were starting to compare notes that way. Yeah. I like it. So what, when I, what I used to call resistance. So then I later defined it as ego. <laughs> and then I later defined it as false self. And like my true self was like that essence of me that was in the zygote at the very beginning of time. And now I guess my question to you is my ego in a sense or my false self, it's not one entity. It's like a, it's a fractured. It's like it's a family that equates to what people perceive to be ego, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the ego has been uh, 
has been vilified too, in the, especially in the spirituality world. You know, it's your monkey mind, it's your ego. It keeps you attached to the world. It, it makes you vain and, and so on and so on. And it's just a collection of little what we call manager parts that are desperately trying to get things for you in your life and not let you forget things. And, and uh, they're, ma- they're managers. <laughs> they're really trying mm-hmm. to, to make your life okay. And they will bug the hell out of you all the time. And they will t- try to get more fame and money and all of that just to make you feel better. And they're not bad. They're just doing their job. Mm-hmm. And, and so the more you can go to them with love and let them know from this place, an open-hearted place, that you don't really need all the things they think you need. Uh, or maybe you still do. Maybe you still have exiles that I could have a big hole in the bucket and they need to be fed all the time. So you got to heal that before you come and tell them they don't have to do what they do. Mm. But yeah, they, they also deserve to be honored and, uh, and nurtured really. Yeah. Yeah. No bad parts. I mean, I guess that's, um, I, I, I find when I get in, this, this is the most, one of the most controversial parts of no bad parts is when I get into conversations with people about the great work you do, and then they'll point out pedophiles or they'll point out, um, like recently um, I work in the poker industry where I freelance and interview poker players and and, and uh, produce poker documentaries. And there was a poker player who, when he was abused when he was younger, and he, he put out a video on Twitter to say, you know, we, we really are slamming pedophiles and we're vilifying them and um, we're ostracizing them and want to just lock them up and throw away the key. And he said, as, a, as an abused child, as a victim of one of these people, um, I think that's wrong. He's like, I, I think we should learn more about them and understand them and to ask them questions and to help them. And he got absolutely massacred. He had to come off social media for having the temerity to be vulnerable and share his story to try to help the world, not just like individuals. Can you, could, have you had any blowback yourself of that type of thing when you say no bad parts? Nothing like that. And I do talk about pedophile. I talk about murderers. And, and I, you know, back when I was learning this, and I would find, oh, the critic isn't what we thought. Oh, the, the addicted part isn't what we thought. Oh, but I think, yeah, but there are still these pedophiles. There are still these, they must be bad. And then I got a job consulting to a treatment center for sex offenders for about seven years. And I worked with all those guys. And when you get past the part that did the offending, you hear the secret history of what, what happened and how... The part who carries the burden of the, his perpetrator's energy, uh, because when when this patient, this this pedophile, was being abused himself, not necessarily sexually, but just abused often physically and so on, there this part was desperate to protect him, and looked around the room and said, "Who has power in this room?" It's this guy who's beating me up, or it's this guy who's screwing me in the butt. Mm. I'm going to take on that, his energy to fight, to combat him, to protect me from him. And then it gets stuck with that perpetrator energy and Mm. the desire to hurt vulnerability. And then that, you know, drives that particular part. And when we can unburden that part, that one got freed up too and turned into something valuable. So... That's when I got to the point where I could say, no, there aren't any bad parts. Yeah. Mm, yeah. No, I, I like that. And, uh, you know, for people listening in, especially this day and age, you know, with everything that's going on with Black Lives Matter and all that kind of thing, you know, there, there's, um, there's almost like a, a drive to silence, like to not talk about things. Like for me, for example, like if I, I'm in L.A. now, but I grew up in Oakmore Vale. Right. So if you grow up in Ogmo Vale of 8,000 people, there's not a single black person who lives in Ogmo Vale. And then the only time I see uh, black people is either through sport or when I'm watching Crime Watch with my mom. 
where the way that they film it is the 90% of uh, criminals will be black. Then when I see someone across the road at nighttime who's black versus someone who's white, I get afraid. But I'm not allowed to talk about that because if I talk about it, I'm racist. racist. But I just want to. But I just want to talk about how I feel. Yeah. And and because I think those conversations are really important. Yeah. One of the things I'm trying to do is to 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 take away a lot of the shame of those conversations. Mm. Because the language of parts allows you to say, yes, there is a part of me that when I see a black guy coming down the street after dark, starts to get scared and starts mm. to say these racist things inside. And that doesn't mean I'm a racist. Mm. It means I have, have a part that, like you, got socialized in, in the United States and carries that legacy burden of racism. Mm. <clears throat> then you can't. You can't grow up in this country being white and not have some of that. Mm. And, and you know, I've taken that position and I've gotten attacked at different times. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm still trying to figure out the right language to use and so on. But I do think that this model can help those conversations a lot. Yeah, I really do. I mean, reading your book... Um... I really, yeah, this is a part of it's like every activist should read this book, you know, it will really help them uh, do their job more effectively. Because at the end of the day, what's it all about? It's all about talking and communication and uh, getting on the same, yeah. being, able, being able to understand people's differences, which is parts. Yeah. And, and Lee, the alternative, like if I were, if I were to say, no, you're a racist for saying that, then you wind up exiling those parts that, to have those racist burdens, and then they'll operate from an unconscious place. Yeah. And it becomes implicit racism, implicit uh, bias. And mm. that's that's not better. They're yeah. not going, you know, they're not going away just because somebody called you a racist. Yeah, very definitely. Um, just before we touched upon your work in the Elements and Coaching Institute. I was buried deep into Carla McLaren's work on the language of emotions. And it was fascinating for me because as, as a kid growing up, I wasn't, I wasn't really allowed to be angry or like the, the example I gave you last night of Zia screaming. Actually, when she screams like that, a part of me gets activated because I wasn't allowed to do that when I was younger. So the part is angry at her and just wants to silence her. I mean, there was a, there was a moment last night in my head where I, I actually had a vision of walking into the bathroom because she'd gone into the bathroom, my wife, picking her up, thrown out the window, yeah. right? Like that, that went through my, that was my, my part fought that last night. Right. Um, and what was I going to, Oh, emotions. And when I, so then to see emotions as gifts, to see my anger as a gift, because I, one of my, biggest challenges in life when I stopped drinking was the anger, the, un, the all the things that was happening, it was causing me drinking. So seeing anger as a gift, seeing shame as a gift, seeing um, uh, fear as a gift and sadness as a gift. It was incredible for me. It really helped my relationships and helped me in, you know, my bid to help other people. And then when I started doing parts work for a long time, I thought, have you ever seen the movie Inside Out, the Pixar movie? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so for a long time, I just, I thought my parts were emotions. Like I would go, oh, there's my angry part. Oh, there's my sad part. Oh, there's yeah. my uh, uh, fearful part. Can you can you talk about that a little bit more? Because I'm sure in as you formulated this over the last uh, you know since 1985, I'm sure you came up to that. Oh, emotions, parts. Uh, what's your thinking around that? Yeah, uh, no, it's easy to make that mistake, and a lot of people do. Um, but parts carry emotions. There, uh, it's a little complicated because. Parts have their own emotions and they have their own talents and they have their own, you know, resources, just like people do. Mm. And then they get stuck with these burdens, which often are emotions. And they get forced into these roles that require those kinds of burdened emotions. And then they become identified as the racist part or as the angry part or as the, the terrified part. 
And that's not all that much better <laughs> mm. for, the, for the part. What they really need is to be able to unload what's not theirs that they got from these experiences and then see who they are without all that. Mm. And what I found over and over is the what's left is always amazingly valuable. And it's mm. often the part, like your angry part, if we unburdened it, now might want to help you connect with people. It's often mm. the opposite of the role it's been in. The critic, when you often, when you unburden the critic, it wants to be a cheerleader. It wants to help you feel good about yourself. So on and so on and so on. So, yeah, so the angry part is not just a bundle of anger and so on. Yeah. And if people are listening to this thinking, how the hell do you, un- do you un- unburden? I just got to, I just got to talk about my, my, uh, the, you know, the, the work that I've done and then hand it over to, to an expert because sometimes the simplicity of this just astounds me. So I work with clients and we will find a part that carries an incredible burden. We will acknowledge that, that burden. And then at some point in the work, we will ask the part, do you want to, do you want to release it? Like, do you want to, and I, most of the time after, especially when trust develops, they're like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. And then afterwards the client's like, I don't know what happened, right? but, but something's changed. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I'm now going to hand it over to the professional, right. But talk about that, about unburdening, you know, cause I think it's really important because in your book, no bad parts, I know you don't um, advocate that people try to unburden exiles, but you certainly talk about getting to know and understand protector parts and firefighters. Yeah. Uh, and so, like I said, people, these parts pick up these burdens and sometimes it's as simple as you just described. You ask the part, do you like having to carry this? And it'll say, no. Would you like to send it out of the system and say, yes, and you do, and it stays. More often, we go to the protector, not like the addict part, not expecting it to change at that moment. So just say, no, it doesn't work. And instead, honoring it for its service, learning about what it protects, going to the exile it protects. And it takes about four more steps to to an exile can unburn first. And this is often quite hard. It's some, some of the hardest work people ever do in their lives. You have to, from a place of compassion, witness what happened to you as a child. Hmm. And stay with it, stay with not only the visual of it, but a lot of times the emotion and the physical sensations and and just stay with that until the part feels like now you finally got it. I've been trying to tell you this for 30 years. and Now you finally have have sat and listened to me about what happened and how bad it was for me. Hmm. And when it feels fully witnessed by you, Lee, then I would say, I want you to go in and be with that boy in the way he needed somebody at the time. Mm. And you wouldn't see yourself. You'd just see him and you'd be there with him. And then we would do some things that he wanted you to do back there before to fix what happened, maybe, what we call a redo, until he was ready to leave with you. And then you'd take him out of that, that place and have him live in your heart or have him some place you could hold, whatever he wanted. Then when all those steps are over, and so it's the witnessing and then the retrieval, which is when you get them back and the redo, then these parts are willing to unload these extreme beliefs and emotions they've been carrying all this time. And we have, I would have you ask the part what it wanted to give it up to, and we offer a menu of the elements. Yeah, I see that. Part picks light, maybe, and you send it off to the light. And the part immediately transforms like a curse has been lifted. Hmm. And you'll, you start to say, oh, he's happy now. He wants to play. He feels much lighter. And we can invite qualities in that he, he pushed away with the, when he got the burden. And that's a, 
unburdening, that's a healing of that boy. And then we invite in the addictive part or whatever protector to see that he's okay now. And what mm. would this addictive part like to do? And would it like to unburden now? Mm. And does it need to be retrieved first? And, and so on and so on. And so that, 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 I think, in the, the world of addictions, there is this problem about, and, I, you know, I, I, I'll probably be attacked for this too, but um, sobriety is such a big value. Like, you have to be sober before you do anything else. And these parts will fight you literally to the death around that in many cases. Mm. Mm. For their, their for their right to protect you, yeah, and keep you not sober. Whereas, if instead you go to the part and you find the what it protects and heal that, then it's it's willing to to stop doing it. Now, I I'm ca- I, I the caveat with that is there are people who are so into the the addiction, then their mind is so you know sodded by it that they can't do the work and you you do need to dry out enough so that you can actually do some work but even then even if i had a client i said you've got to go to this treatment center i would say and i'm going to send you to a treatment center where they're going to honor this part for its service to you Uh, it's we're not going to send you because you're an alcoholic we're not going to send you because you don't have enough willpower. You know, any of those Mm. shaming frames for why people drink. Yeah. Um, We're going to send you because we want to honor this part for its service and heal the parts it protects. Yeah. Yeah. At the beginning of every podcast episode, I always say my name is Lee Davey and I'm not an alcoholic and I refuse to be anonymous because for me, the legacy burden of like I have a 20 year old son now whose mom has an alcohol problem, whose dad does what he does and helps people to stop drinking alcohol. Um, but the peer pressure for him to drink alcohol in his twenties versus not, it's just too much. And there, there are parts of him who are not willing to, to let go. And he's understanding of that. And he, and he's aware of that. Right. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's really important that, when you recognize the power of this legacy burden that actually being an alcoholic actually underpays like a really fundamental part to it. And, and I know that a lot of people listening to this who've done AA will say being recognized as an alcoholic changed my life, saved my life. I, I get that. But I also see a lot of people who refuse to get help because they don't fit the template of the alcoholic as the legacy burden creates. So it allows and it allows the part of parts to use that ignorance to say, we're okay, Jack, we can keep drinking. I'm going to keep you safe. We're going to keep drinking because we're not like that. And when we're like that, then, then, then we'll stop. And then, you know, like my dad, my poor old dad, like he was my dad. And I was 70, something like that. Like my dad would never say he was a quote unquote alcoholic. But if I said, dad, let's just never drink alcohol again. He would be like, no, I, I don't want to do that. But the truth of it is he, he wouldn't be able to. Now, as he gets older, he, he will. But when he was younger, drinking every Saturday, drinking every Sunday, <laughs> there was a reason he was doing that. And he couldn't just let it go. But, but the, the medical literature wouldn't deem him as being problematic Mm -hmm. that's right and a lot of times if he did let it go again through the kind of willpower approach uh he'd become a dry drunk you know he would yeah or he'd become depressed or suicidal yeah he'd find some other or he'd become a workaholic or he'd become you know there's still those exiles don't go anywhere no, so no, you still have to have a way to deal with them. Yeah, and yeah. some of the, some of the ways are more socially, you know, sanctioned and appropriate, or or um, rewarded than others. That's all. Yeah, yeah. So if you're listening to this, as I keep banging on all the time, we're not here to help you stop drinking. 
That's the easy part. The hardest part is what you do after that. You know, that's, that's a great line. That's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. I want to ask you one more, one more. Uh, it's not a question, but I want to uh, ask you to comment on one thing that I've noticed in in quite a few of my clients. Um, I would say that I attract people who are more in their masculine energy than their feminine. And I've noticed in a lot of clients I work with this battle in internally between an unhealthy masculine and a healthy feminine or a, a healthy masculine and an unhealthy feminine. And when they, when the client recognizes this, they almost self-led, bring them into the room together mm-hmm. and boy gets on with girl. And they realize that they have to be more yin and yang, like in their, in their balance. And I've seen amazing things happen uh, from an addiction. We're just getting that balance right with feminine male energy. Have you have you found that in? I obviously you are, but what's your comment on that in your work? Yeah, I've found uh, some versions of that. You know, I'll, I'll I'll be working with a macho guy, CEO or something, and suddenly he'll he'll be really upset because he f- he focused inside. And he found this little girl in there. And oh my God, what's that doing there? You know, yeah. And does it mean I'm gay or you know? And but you're right. As you bring them together, and you can be accepting of that girl, and then uh, a lot of things start to change. So I think you're onto something. Well, Dick, thank you again. Um, you are. I'm glad you kept at it. <laughs> and now you're having your renaissance in the last decade. Long may continue. Um, people out there, buy no bad parts. What are you up to, uh, Dick, so people can, you know, where are they going to catch up with you and what are you up to? Oh, you know, we have our annual conference coming up in about a week, a little more than mm-hmm. a week. So uh, people can find that, uh, that and a lot of other stuff on our website, which is ifs-institute.com. So... Get over there, folks, and get that book, No Bad Parts, and start doing the work yourself. You don't you don't need a coach. You can do it yourself. And then, oh, by the way, IFS coaches, some of the most cheapest or cost-effective, we'll say, coaches in the world. So definitely go and check out an IFS specialist. Uh, Dick, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your time, my friend. Really finally, I, I didn't know what to expect, and I had a great time, so it's great. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. What a lovely human being, right? Like, I mean, what an amazing energy, a beautiful human being doing some incredible, incredible work. And if you're going to take one thing away from this, um, I, I would hope that it is this, right? And that is that there are no bad parts, okay? So when you look around at all the people that are really causing you some significant pain in the world, all right, I want. I know it's going to be very difficult for you, but I want you to look at them and try to look at them in a different way. And this doesn't mean that you that you should destroy your boundaries and let them keep inflicting you with pain, but just look at them and see um, that there is a, a part of them or several parts of them that are just doing the best they can to keep them safe. And at the same time, that may be creating havoc and causing you some physical or emotional pain, right? So I'm not saying we don't need our boundaries and we need to get away from these people, but we can look at people through a fresh set of eyes after listening to this podcast. Um, and rather than playing the blame game, we can start to have some empathy and some compassion. Um, and what a great difference this would make in the world if we could all lead in this way, right? So um, please spread this love. Please spread the message. Tell people about this episode. Um, rate and review the episode on the podcast. And if you do want to work on um, internal family systems and parts work, then I'm trained in the arts of this stuff. So you can uh, reach me at www.1000daysober.com um, or email me at 1kdaysober at gmail.com uh, to do some work with me on this. Um, alternatively, if you want to join our Strive family and our community and uh, get access to our over 120 coaching videos in the Strive method, then it is 99 US dollars a month subscription. Cancel anytime you want. And if you don't like it, as long as you've done the homework and put the work in, then I will refund you and give you your money back. So again, get over to 1000daysober.com to sign up for that. All right, much love, everybody. Take care.